All right, last week we launched this new series called Holy Christian, and Ben and I had a conversation in front of you about the nature of discipleship in the church. We talked about the job that Jesus has given us to make disciples, and a disciple is simply someone who spends time with Jesus to become like Jesus in order to do what Jesus did. They spend time with Jesus to become like Jesus, to do what Jesus uh, did. And this is the invitation that Jesus extended to his first disciples, and it's also the invitation uh, to us. He said, come, follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. Come, spend time with me. Come into a relationship with me. Spend time with me. Follow me and become like me. Be transformed into my image, and then you're going to go out and do for others what I've done uh, for you. And in this one sentence, we talked about this last week, so I just want to kind of catch you up. Uh, In this sentence, we have the three phases, the three stages of discipleship, invitation, transformation, and delegation. So every Jesus follower, if you're a Jesus follower today, you should be moving through these three things. Like if if you're a new Christian, you've been a Christian for just a little bit, you've accepted the invitation to come to Jesus in relationship. You are now in stage two of uh, transformation. Now, how long does stage two last? Well, Jesus spent three years with his disciples in, in this phase, in the transformation phase. He taught them what it meant to live uh, the life in the kingdom of God, and the summation of the kingdom life is recorded for us in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Uh, it is the longest cohesive teaching of Jesus that we have on record. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. And if you want to know what Christianity is supposed to look like and sound like and smell like and taste like and feel like, you just read those three chapters. For three years, Jesus taught and lived out the Sermon on the Mount in front of his disciples. And then in Matthew 28, he sent them out to live the kingdom life. He sent them out to fish uh, for people. He sent them out as, as his ambassadors to make disciples where they lived, where they worked, and where they played. They were to live it into every corner of their being. And so here, here's the thing. If the disciples spent three years uh, with Jesus in phase two, like let's give ourselves at least four years, right? Because we're not with Jesus in, in the flesh. So if you've been following Jesus for at least four years, and maybe there's some exception to that, but at least four years, you ought to be here. You should really be in the delegation stage where you are replicating your life. You should be modeling for others what it means to follow Jesus, what it means to live life in the kingdom of God. And the point we made last week is that not, many, not very many Christians, not very many Jesus followers are actually doing this. They're not making disciples, which means the problem isn't really here. We've got to back up. The problem is in the transformation stage. Like there there are some Christians that are just not being fully transformed into the character of Christ and so they're not stepping into the call and the command of Christ to make disciples. And so this series we're in is really about addressing this issue of transformation and how we change. We want to do everything we can as a church to foster an environment of transformation because as we said last week, that is the ultimate goal of the Christian life. When we experience transformation, we embrace the delegation to make disciples. It just becomes part of who we are. It just happens naturally. Making disciples is not difficult when you're a wholehearted, whole-brained disciple of Jesus yourself. It It just comes out of you. You just do it naturally. And so that's what this series is about, engaging our faith with our whole self, and in particular, with our whole brain. Now, there's been extensive research on how people change, on how people transform, and the evidence shows that character formation is largely a function of the right half of our brains. And so our brain, you know this, our brains are dual processors, right? There's the left side, which is more cerebral. It's responsible for problem solving and creating strategies and conscious thought and speech and logic and reason. But then there's the right side, which is the more emotional side, the more relational side that's responsible for assessing our situation, our surroundings at all times. It's, it's where we draw our individual identity, uh, our relational uh, attachments, who we're connected to. But in our post 
uh, Enlightenment Western context in the church, we have built most of our strategies on growth and transformation and discipleship toward left brain activity. It kind of looks like this. Information plus application equals modification. Like if you just consume content, get some knowledge, get some information, apply that to your life, it will modify some things in your life. It'll, it'll change some things. And, and in the church context, it's get the right beliefs and that will lead you to the right behavior. Right? That's left brain Christianity. So let's just play this out, taking one of the Ten Commandments. For example, like the information is, thou shalt not lie. So if you would apply that to your life, it, it will modify your behavior to where you don't lie. You're now an honest person. But I bet you know some honest Christians who aren't very loving. I bet that's true for you. If you don't lie, but you're not loving, then you have missed the point of why thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not lie because lying is not loving. Lying hurts the other person. See, information plus application has led a lot of Christians to behavior modification. They believe the right things and they do the right things mostly, but then they miss the main thing, which is love. The goal of the Christian life is not behavior modification. It's character transformation. And character transformation is largely a right brain function that happens in relationships. Jesus knew this because Jesus knew everything, right? He was God. So he added another Asian to the equation, okay? Information plus imitation plus application equals transformation. This was the way of Jesus. Jesus engaged the whole self, the whole brain in discipleship. Everything he taught the disciples was in the context of relationship where he lived it out in front of them. They were able to digest what Jesus was teaching because they watched him live it out. He didn't just tell them, he showed them. It was relational. Prayer is a great example of this. We get the Lord's Prayer from a question the disciples asked Jesus. They said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Now, prayer wasn't a foreign concept for them. Prayer was a vital part of the Jewish life. There were three prescribed times a day that every faithful Jew would spend time in prayer. They knew how to pray. They just didn't know how to pray the way Jesus prayed. They saw something completely different in Jesus. Like he, the way he prayed caused them to believe that, they, that he had some kind of connection to God. And they wanted to know what that was. And so they asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus did not launch into a three-point sermon. He did not teach a class called Prayer 101. He did not hold a seminar on prayer. He did not give them a cute acrostic. He prayed. He said, this is how you should pray. And I think the reason that so many Christians struggle with this idea of making disciples is because their personal experience with discipleship is, is one on many rather than one on one or one on a few. They've never had someone to imitate. And so I just want you to play that in your mind. Has there been anybody in your life that you have come along and imitated? Somebody who's a little further ahead of you in the journey that you've kind of been following, picking up what they're laying down ahead of you, imitating. Character transformation happens in the context of community where there's information plus imitation. Where there's be honest with people and here's how we actually do that. Where there's honor God with your finances, and here's how we actually do that. Where there's practice forgiveness when someone has offended you, and here's how we actually do that. Where there's consider others above yourself, and here's how we actually do that. Where there's submit to one another as husbands and wives in your marriage, and here's how we actually do that. 
The Bible is full of really good information, really good wisdom, but it's more easily understood in the context of relationship. It's more easily applied when someone can show us rather than just tell us. That's why what we do in this room on Sunday morning is not the be-all, end-all. It is vitally important to your journey with Jesus, but it doesn't end here. If it ends here, you're never going to completely grow into the image of Jesus because character transformation happens mostly in community. Information can modify your behavior, absolutely. But imitation, imitation is what leads to character transformation. You and I are relational beings, so change, transformation happens mostly in relational environments. And the foundation of transformation that we're going to talk about today is a three-letter word word called joy. Joy. And if we're being honest... These three letters don't show up very often in our story. Or at least as often as we would like them to. There's there's a J, but it stands for, for jaded. Like life hasn't turned out the way that you thought it would. It's been one disappointment after another, and you're just you're just a little cynical about life. There's not really any joy. There's an O, but it stands for overwhelmed. There's so much stuff coming at you. There's so many responsibilities that you that you have. You you just have trouble managing everything in your life. There's a there's a Y, but it stands for yuck. It's how we feel most days about the world with all of its heartbreaking headlines. Just yuck. But joy, well, that's just not a, a word we have a lot of experience with. But listen, that's not how the story started. If you and I had a reset button that restored us back to our original factory setting, joy is the default. Joy is the default setting of creation and of the human existence. Everything God created in Genesis 1 and 2 was good and for our enjoyment. It was good and it was for our enjoyment. The sun and moon, while they serve a purpose in creation, they also serve for our enjoyment. That's why we're fascinated with sunsets, sunrises. Super blue moons, right? We're fascinated by that. We enjoy it. The the land and sea was created for our enjoyment. That's why we love vacations where there's amazing landscapes or we love to be on the water. It was created for our enjoyment. Animals were created for our enjoyment. I think it's why we are so fascinated with wildlife and it's instinctive for us uh, to get up close because it, our default setting was to live in, in partnership, right, with, with these creatures. And so we just longed to, to see them up close and personal, right? Like my wife wanting to pet a grizzly bear in Yellowstone. Like, it's just, we're drawn toward that. I think there's a reason for that. Marriage was created between a man and a woman for the, their mutual benefit and enjoyment. Sex was created... Uh, between a husband and a wife for their mutual benefit and their enjoyment. And and God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden for the purpose of relational enjoyment. Joy was the original condition of creation and it was shared in relationship with God and with his people, God and each other. But when sin and brokenness entered the world, it disrupted our relationships and it hijacked our joy. And the Bible is ultimately a story about how God restores our joy. You cannot read scripture and and not draw the conclusion that joy is one of God's deepest desires for us. The theme of joy is just woven throughout the pages of the Bible. Psalm 16 Verse 11 says, you reveal the path of life to me in your presence is abundant joy. 
In your presence is abundant joy. The path of life is, di- is directly connected to abundant joy. When you walk with Jesus, when you follow Jesus, he always leads you in the right direction. He leads you on the right path. And in his presence, there is joy. Now, in the original Hebrew, the word presence is actually face. It's literally, in your face is abundant joy. Like the face of God is so radiant with joy. Like God, God, Moses said, hey, I want to see your face, God. He's like, you can't handle that. I'll put you in a cleft of the rock and I'll walk by and I'll cover your face and you can see my glory that way. But, but you can't handle all of this joy. It's too radiant for you. There's joy in the face of God. And if your picture of God, if your view of God is that he is angry at you, disappointed with you, disgusted with you, mad at you, there is no joy in that whatsoever. You will never be full of joy if you believe God is full of anger at you. My friends, that is not who God is. I don't know where you picked that up, but you need to lay it down. That is not how God feels about you. If you're a parent, what was the look on your face when you first laid eyes on your newborn baby? (laughs) What is that, right? Is that what it was? Now, I've seen some of your babies, and that was the look on my face, but I... (laughs) I mean, just go back to that moment. Remember, they were slimy. Their head was shaped like a cone. Moms, they caused you hours of pain in the middle of labor. You wondered why you ever let your husband touch you in the first place. And you're like, it'll never happen again. I like, just remember all of that. And when you looked at that newborn baby, in your face was abundant joy. In your face was abundant joy. That baby had sucked the life out of you for nine months. You vomited nearly every morning, right? It caused cold sweats from caffeine detox and hours of labor. And and you did not look on her with disgust. You did not look at him with anger. In your face was abundant joy. And your heavenly father looks at you the same way. He is not angry at you, mad at you, disgusted by you, disappointed with you. He delights in you. You are his pride and joy. In the book of Numbers, God gave Israel a blessing that became a regular prayer for them as a nation. And you probably heard this. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. If you were to reframe how God sees you, that his face shines on you, that he looks at you with favor, what do you think that might do to your joy tank? See, the same God who stood on the edge of creation and spoke the world into existence wants to walk in relationship with you and make his face shine on you. That's why he created you. His deepest desire is for you to experience joy. And that only comes, it only comes in relationship with God and in relationship with people. If either of those two things is missing, then so is your joy. It's just the way God designed it, and science agrees. Neuroscience has discovered uh, that joy is essential to our emotional and relational development, and facial recognition is what ignites the joy center in our brain. It's what happens when you look at that newborn baby. And it's what happens when that newborn baby looks back at you and smiles. It's not because you're pretty. It's because you're his people. You're her people. They just know instinctively 
This is my person. It's the only thing. It's the only thing they know. See, while the left side of our brain is constantly trying to figure out what's going on around us, the right side of our brain is constantly scanning our surroundings, looking for our people. If it's a sad occasion, we're scanning, we're looking for the people we do life with to come and comfort us. If it's a happy occasion, we're looking for those same people to come and celebrate with us. It's just what we do. When the U.S. defeated the Soviets in, in the 1980 Olympics, this was one of the most epic photos that was captured in that moment. This is Jim Craig, who was the goalie for the American team. And while the Americans are celebrating, he's scanning the crowd for his father. Because all that mattered in this moment was to share the joy of the occasion with his dad. Because not long before this, he shared with his dad the sorrow of losing his mom. And you see this all the time. At any major, any major win, whether it's a Super Bowl or the World Series or you know the Masters, they're running to the stands to celebrate the joy of the moment with their family and their closest friends. See, Christian or not, whether you follow Jesus or not, this is just intuitive to us. We just already do what Paul tells us in Romans 12. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. You just do this automatically. We just do this relationally. And when we have community around us, when we have people who will weep with us, It's how we consider it pure joy when we suffer trials of many kinds. That's what James 1, 2 says. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you suffer trials of many kinds. Really, James? Really? And the only way you do that is by people who weep with you. When you weep, you you and I can't rejoice well alone. And we can't weep well alone because God didn't create us to be alone. He designed us for relationships and he wired us up for joy. Those two things are not mutually exclusive. Joy and relationships are interconnected. And you may be thinking, wait a minute, isn't Jesus sufficient enough for our joy? Like People just disappoint us and it's true. People do disappoint us. But that doesn't change the fact that God created us as relational beings. All right, if if you get Tom Hanks and end up on a deserted island, the Holy Spirit will be sufficient for you. But guess what? You're not on a deserted island. And even then, Tom Hanks found, found a friend in a volleyball, right? Gave him a name, Wilson. See, other people are an important part of our joy quota. You can't read scripture and separate joy and people. Yes, people bring pain, but they also bring joy. Remember the theologian in the late 1900s, Rob Bass? Joy, pump, pump, pump it up. Pain, come on, come on. Like sunshine, what else, what else? Sing it out, God's children. (laughs) He was a prophet, didn't even know it. Joy and pain, that's what happens. It's like sunshine and rain. See, in this broken world, we get both. Joy is what God intended. Pain is what God redeems. And both help us grow. Both help us grow. Paul talks about the joy that he has in the people he loves, First Thessalonians, he says this, but as for us, brothers and sisters, after we were forced to leave you for a short time, in person, not in heart, we greatly desired and made every effort to return and see you, what? Face to face. So we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us, Satan hindered us, Satan hindered us. Hold on to that thought. For who is our hope or joy or crown of boasting in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and our joy. 
Paul wrote to Timothy, his young disciple, and he said, I I long to see you so that my heart might be filled with joy. He wrote to Philemon, the book of Philemon, the letter of Philemon in our Bible. It says, for I have great joy and encouragement from your love. Great joy and encouragement from your love. Paul's joy was connected to his God and to his people, to his disciples. But we have an enemy whose goal is to steal and kill and destroy. And he does that best by disconnecting us. He drives a wedge. He sows a seed of division. He hinders us in some way, just like he did Paul. Now, why would Satan want to waste time hindering Paul from seeing his people? Doesn't he have more important things to do to to knock us off mission? No. He does not. That's how he kills the mission. He's trying to do the same thing in your life. He's trying to hinder you because when Satan disconnects us from our people, it disrupts our joy. And when our joy is disrupted, we go looking for it in other places. And it's how we wreck our character. Author and clinical psychologist Jim Wilder who's done extensive research on the brain, especially as it's connected to discipleship and transformation. He says, our brain desires joy more than anything else. More than anything else. And so when our joy gets hijacked, when it gets disrupted, we go looking for it in other places. We turn to things like drugs. We turn to things like alcohol or or high sugar foods or shopping or pornography. Everybody has something they begin to run after if their joy is low. If your joy is low because you're disconnected from a relationship, you will fill it somewhere else. You will find that joy somewhere else. So what is that for you? What is the pseudo joy in your life? Like do you drink alcohol to take the edge off? Having a drink is is fine, not a problem with that, but when it becomes three or four or five, it's likely that you're searching for joy because you're missing community. Do you have an Amazon habit? Apparently. (laughs) Nothing wrong, nothing wrong with buying things you enjoy. But when you buy things for joy, it's a problem. I mean, COVID was, uh, it's the greatest example of this. Joy was at an all-time low because we were separated from each other. We were separated from each other. Studies showed an increase during that time, an increase in anxiety, an increase in depression, an increase in Opioid overdoses and Amazon profits increased by 200%. Now, some of that was obviously because we couldn't get out, but a lot of it was because we were trying to prime some joy to our front door. It's true. That's what isolation will do to us. Because God wired us for relationships. And when we're not in authentic relationships, we will find our joy somewhere else and it will wreck our character. Isolation is one of Satan's greatest strategy, right? Because when we lack connection, we lose our joy and we just, we're, we're gonna replace it with something else. But a substitute never satisfies, you know this. Pseudo joy will wreck your character, but real joy will transform it. And real joy is the result of real relationships where you can know and be known and love and be loved. Joy is what you feel and experience when you are with people who are glad to be with you. Here's what Jim Wilder writes. He says, when when we are the sparkle in someone's eyes, their face lights up with a smile when they see us. 
We feel joy. From the moment we're born, joy shapes the chemistry structure and growth of our brain. Joy lays the foundation for how well we handle relationships, emotions, pain, and pleasure throughout our lifetime. Joy creates an identity that is stable and consistent over time. Joy gives us the freedom to share our hearts with God and others, the freedom to live without masks because in spite of our weaknesses, we know we are loved. We are not afraid of our vulnerabilities or exposure. Joy gives us the freedom from fear to live from the heart Jesus gave us. We discover increasing delight in becoming the people God knew we could be. And I would say the people God created us to be. See, joy is the foundation for transformation since God formed us with joy. He programmed that into us. He formed us with joy. He can only transform us with joy. We can't be transformed without it. When you have true joy, you are operating from your true identity. That's when you're acting like your true self, the one that God created you to be. And while isolation is one of Satan's greatest strategies, joy is one of his greatest threats. Because when you have joy, you have people. And when you have people, you rejoice well and you suffer well. You rejoice well and you suffer well. Joy doesn't mean everything is good. We know that. Not everything in life is good. It means you are good. In spite of everything that's going on in your life, it means that you are good because you know God is with you and your people are too. See, joy is not circumstantial. It's a disposition we have in life because we know our identity is anchored in our creator and we have relationships that are moving us closer toward him. So who are your people? Who, who, are your, who are your people? Because I'm just telling you, if you don't have people, you'll, you won't have joy. It's impossible. And I know that there are many in this room today, I say that, and you feel it immediately. You feel alone. You feel isolated. You feel disconnected. There's not much joy in in your story. And when there's not much joy in your story, it makes it really hard to manage life. There's anxiety, there's depression, there's worry, there's stress, there's fear, but there's not much joy. See, it's a sad state of affairs when you can feel more joy in a bar than you can feel it in church. And it's not because of the drinks. It's because of the people. It's because of the relational connection that's taking place. And I'm just telling you, the church should be the most joyful place on the planet because it ought to be full of people who are glad to be together in the presence of Jesus whose face is shining on us. And so if you're missing joy today, if you're lacking joy today, it's not because Jesus isn't with you. It's not because God is angry at you or mad at you or disappointed in you. It's not because his face isn't shining on you. It's it's one of two things. It's because either you're not walking with Jesus or you're walking with Jesus alone. If either of those things are true, joy will continue to be something you long for rather than live in. Joy does not need to be something you long for. God wants it to be something that you live in. And so if either of those things are true for you, like we can take care of both of those things today. We can help you find community And if you're walking alone. And if you've not accepted the invitation to come into relationship with Jesus, to be transformed by him, if you've never done that, we can help you take that step. See, Jesus, the whole point 
of his coming. The entire reason that God became flesh and walked among this earth in the personhood of Jesus was to restore our relationship with God and with each other so that we could restore our joy. Because God created us to have joy. And so Jesus spent three years with his disciples living it out, living joy in front of them, living the kingdom life in front of them, showing them what God intended from the beginning. And on the night before his crucifixion, he winds down his teaching and he puts it all into perspective for them and he says this, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. Now, right here, Jesus puts it all together. Commands, that's our information. Just as I have. That's imitation. Keep those commands, that's the application. And if you do that, then your joy may be complete. Transformation. See, transformation is not elusive. It's just what happens when we add imitation to our information and application. It's what happens when we follow Jesus along with other people. So right now, we're going to spend some time taking communion, which is just this weekly reminder of how much God loves us, of how much his face shines on us, of how much he desires to restore our joy so much so that he was willing to take up a cross. And he did so with joy. Hebrews 12, 2 says, For the joy set before him, for the joy set before him, Jesus took up a cross, scorning its shame. Jesus took joy in taking up a cross because his death and resurrection is what makes it possible for us to experience the joy he created us for. So let's just spend some time. If you need communion, these guys are walking around. You can raise your hand. Well, let me pray for you. Father, thank you for the theology of joy. For the reminder that this is what you created us for. You you wired us up for joy. And there's so many things that have stolen our joy in this broken world. But Jesus promises to renew it, to restore it, to transform us in it. We're grateful for the joy you took in sending your son. And for the joy Jesus took in taking up a cross on our behalf. We remember you in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen.